As I was putting together my thoughts for today, I came up with this title, A Journey of Courage. But it wasn't where I started. I started with something much more men men mundane for an AGM. What next for upstart? Except that once I had posed that question to myself, I came up, I found myself on a whole journey of other questions. Like, how did we end up needing a campaign for play? And when did promoting play come to be <laughs> radical? And then I got to, is there something about play that scares us? And that's when I realized that exploring those questions take us on a journey of courage. So that's what I want to do today. I want to take us on a journey of courage, and it has four stops. The first one is the Resilience Tour, which has been across the whole of Scotland in a way that Tina Hendry and I never dreamed it would be when we started it. The second stop is this lovely little house. The third stop is Matthew Thompson's fantastic book from 2013 called Lost Freedom. And finally, I want to think about fear. Does all that sound okay to you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Okay then. Let's start here. Let's start with resilience. Can I ask, do all of you know about the Scottish tour of resilience? Yes. 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 Because <laughs> there are some people who have come to it very late. And that's okay that they've come to it late, but I have worked very hard to make sure that even if they came to it late, that we are thinking about what it means that Scotland has created 25 screenings across the whole of this country since the end of April with over 2,500 people attending one of those screenings. The distributors, Dartmouth Films, tell me that they have never known another region to embrace an independent film. So Scotland is setting a kind of standard for how films can impact the thinking of a culture. That's what it looks like, that's what it feels like when a country embraces a film. So this was the tour, okay, there's 25 screenings and you can see that 20 out of 25 of them sold out, which is why some people drove for several hours to get to the nearest screening that they could get to that still had tickets. So for anybody in the room who might not be fully up on what is that film about, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. That film, Resilience, which is the biology of stress and the science of hope, is the strap line, looks at the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which was done in 1998. It's 20 years ago. And what that study found was that if you as a child had experienced one of these 10 forms of adversity, it changed your biology in a way that had an impact over your lifetime. And what they realized is that you could come up with a score, now known as an ACE score, of zero to 10. So I experienced none of these, or I experienced all 10. So physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, or your mother was treated violently, there was substance misuse in your household, you had a parent in prison, you had a parent with mental illness, or your parents got divorced. Now since then, they, there have been other studies that have followed this up and they have identified other adverse experiences, bereavement, living in a neighborhood with violence, living in poverty. But the key study in 1998 that went on to begin changing thinking in quite a seminal way started with these 10 experiences. And what they were able to show in this study is that those experiences led to adult health <coughs> problems that still we don't often put together. So heart disease, liver disease, obesity, alcoholism, drug use, smoking, suicide, and a number of others that I can't fit on a slide. <coughs> the idea that your childhood experiences of fear and stress should have left biological changes that it would affect your health was astounding at the time that these researchers came up with it. 
And as they tell in the film, people laughed at them and said, someone would know if that was the case. Are you really willing to damage your career by thinking about the emotional underpinnings of health? That's not the way public health researchers operate. But they were courageous enough to pursue the insights they thought they were beginning to get. And that's what the film tells us about, is the journey to discovery of this effect, to use the fancy scientific term. So I want to just give us, a, remind us a flavor of that. So this is one of their graphs from the original study. It shows that as your ACE score climbs, particularly to four or more, your risk of becoming alcoholic increases. With every single adverse experience you have, your risk of becoming alcoholic increases. Here's another insight that comes out of that. Robert Block, who was president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, named adverse childhood experiences as the single greatest unaddressed public health threat facing the American nation today. And once you get as far as America, we can begin to ask, is that Scotland? Is that England? Is that Wales? Is that Northern Ireland? Is that Australia? Is that New Zealand? Is that Italy? Here's another one. <clears throat> this is from Ace is Too High. That's an organization, and they like to quote this one little insight, which I think is very powerful for us today. The likelihood of a child having a learning or behavior problem in school is 32 times higher if their A score is 4 as opposed to an A score of 0. 32 times higher. Every teacher in the country should have the opportunity to know that one sentence which is why we're filming it. We're going to put it on film and then everybody will hear it. <laughs> here's one more. So here's a much more up-to-date ACEs study, which many people won't have heard about it because this was done in 2016, long after they had stopped filming for the Resilience film. This is a piece in the journal Pediatrics entitled Adverse Experiences in Early Childhood and Kindergarten Outcomes. I have heard of this organization in Scotland that would really like to have a kindergarten stage. You might have heard of it too. <laughs> Here's the conclusion for this piece of research. This study revealed strong links between ACEs in early childhood and poor academic readiness by the end of kindergarten, which placed children at elevated risk for poor educational achievement and subsequent health. Thus, adverse outcomes associated with ACE exposure begin in early childhood and impact multiple aspects of children's lives. The findings from this study underscore the need for integrated cross-sector approaches to enhance the development of vulnerable children. That study speaks to why Sue Palmer wants us to raise our hands and say, who's from health? Who's from early years? Who's from education? Who's from social work? Because when we split, split education into something separate from <coughs> social work, into something separate from early years, which means before education, we don't get it. So this film has helped us in some new ways to get it. And here's some of the feedback from that film. Here's what an hour's film has done for people. So a family worker says, this was a light bulb moment for me. Latitude LT on Twitter says, we need to get this film to every classroom in the country. And people who drove up from Newcastle, because nobody down there was hosting a local screening, said, it was brilliant. My colleagues and I left so inspired and invigorated. And I want to keep pushing here the, the consequences and the impact for our country of a film. Because two crazy people, Suzanne Dedeich and Tina Henry, decided that the country should have an opportunity to see this film. Here's what it looks like. Here's what a really big audience in Falkirk looks like. This is Falkirk High School. The head teacher of Falkirk High School was on the panel discussion and he said, I didn't know about trauma or ACEs until a few weeks ago. 
And his willingness to stand on the panel and say that gave everyone else in the audience the opportunity to say that they didn't know either. And I will be forever grateful to his willingness to say that. He didn't have to hide behind pretending that he knew because he was somehow embarrassed to say that he didn't know. Lots of people don't know. We didn't used to know. But now we do. How do we help people to know? Here is a very brave woman standing up in that large audience willing to ask a question. Here's Dundee. Here's another large audience. Here's another brave woman <laughs> willing to stand up and ask a question about play. And here's one more brave woman. And from that tour, this woman particularly stands in my mind. This is clearly Sue Ann Newport. She's a nurse. She's featured in that film, Resilient. And she stays with me because what she says in that film is, this is the hard part to face. When I did my ACE score, it wasn't zero or one. And she stays with me because my ACE score isn't zero or one either. Which brings me to the second stop on our journey. This is a lovely house, do you not think? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like a chocolate box house <laughs> or a shortbread tin house. <clears throat> this is the house where I spent some of the most memorable years of my childhood. And this is the field next to our house where we spent lots of time playing. So that's the rabbit hutch where I raise rabbits. That's my father's pickup truck where we spent hours playing at camping in the bed of his truck. That's the tree where we hung a rope swing every spring. And that's the 50 acres of woods that we played in all day long at the weekend. That's the barn. That's the room that technically we kept the feed bins in, but it served as our windy house. And we thought the feed bins were stove tops where you could mix very good mud pies which my blessed father sometimes actually ate. <laughs> that is true fathering on the week after Father's Day. That's the loft. It was covered in hay where myself and my three younger brothers and sisters slept every night during the summer in that hay loft where I read them books, which the Scottish Book Trust will be glad to know. <laughs> I read them books like Where the Wild Things Are, and Charlotte's Web, and my personal favorite, Island of the Blue Dolphins. And as we were doing the resilience tour, and as I was putting together this presentation, I found myself thinking that the reason for telling you this story of one life and one child who grew up, one of millions and zillions of children in the world, is that I think I developed my resilience in play. I now realize how much of an impact I think that those fields and that rope swing and my rabbits and those hours running round, the opportunity to run round <coughs> this piece of land that my parents had purchased, how much that play and resilience mattered. Well, I coped with the adverse childhood experiences that I was facing inside that chocolate box house. Play builds resilience in our children's bodies and it gives them other opportunities and experiences alongside whatever else is going on in their lives. Which brings me to the third stop on our journey of courage. Matthew Thompson's fantastic book in 2013 called Lost Freedom and then the subtitle, The Landscape of the Child and the British Post-War Settlement, <laughs> which doesn't sound like it's very much about play, does it? What I love about this book, and some of you are scribbling down, and I'm glad about that, that means Matthew Thompson's sales will go up. <laughs> what I like about this book is that he helps us to think about how a historical, <coughs> cultural period shapes the experiences that children can have. 
the, the political discussions going on at the time shape children's real lives and therefore the biology that, that they take forward into their future. So here's a quote from that book. He says, attachment theory, <coughs> which emerged during that period after World War II, called attention to the importance of protection and love in the family home. <coughs> and then he points out something that we often forget when we talk about attachment. It also emphasized the importance of play and freedom. And if you need that said more concisely, here's another way to say it. The psychological need to play emerged from this period of scientific study to be as much a dictum as was attachment. For the people who birthed attachment theory, John Bowlby, James Robertson, Klein, Freud, play was seen as emotionally vital. So Thompson's historical analysis of this period after World War II, when attachment theory was being born, when because it's after World War II, society was in the midst of a lot of change, shows us the origins of some of the key themes that I think we have in today's debates. So here are two of them. One is caring for children, and I was sitting at the back there when, when David said, Education can be done in caring for children. I was going, yes, back to my slides, good, there's a link. Okay. Thompson talks about caring for children. And he summarizes it this way. He says, Bowlby offered a simple and universal solution to virtually any question about child care. Bowlby's answer was, provide as much love as possible, love them and leave them be. And then he added, stop worrying and relax. Here's the second thing that Thompson talks about. He makes us think about British culture and he said these ideas from attachment theory and play and freedom and the protection of the family home, these ideas were from their beginnings in the 1940s entangled with the creation of a modern social democratic welfare state. Which is interesting because when we train early years staff or teachers in attachment theory, we normally do not bring any politics and a social democratic state vision to talking about scientific theory. And yet Matthew Thompson is trying to remind us that they were from the beginning interwoven and they are still. It's, it's very interesting that when we think about these, we can find themes then with themes today. So this is Alison Gopnik's book in 2016 called The Gardener and the Carpenter. And when it was reviewed last year in The Guardian, here's how they summarized her argument. She says, we worry too much and we do too much for them. Children flourish when they are given freedom. When it comes to looking after kids, be a gardener, not a carpenter. Plant the environment in which they will flourish. Stop trying to make them, create them, and carve them. We hurt them when we try to create them rather than fertilize them. So that theme was there in the 1940s. Here's the other theme that the Resilience Tour reminded me links those two time periods as well. When we were at the Aberdeen screening, one of the brave women in the audience stood up and said this, with the expansion of government funded childcare, the state becomes more and more involved in the raising of our children carried out by professional staff. And there are a number of you in this audience whose head are, is nodding very vigorously. I'm glad, because if we really get this, we need to be scared. 
If our children are in institutions at younger and younger ages, and they are institutions that see themselves filled with professional staff who are not allowed to cuddle children and hug children, and who see it as their role to start education earlier because they come under an education silo as opposed to an integrated health silo or social work silo or integration, if they don't understand the biology, if they don't understand attachment, if they don't get how important relationships are, will damage them. And no one will mean to. And it takes courage to ask that. So here's what I find myself asking, thinking about this lovely comment from a woman brave enough to stand up in the Aberdeen screening <coughs> and Matthew Thompson's book. Does the state get it? Well, listen, can you hear that for the film? There's a little ripple there. No. And of course, I want to ask, does the state get it with regard to attachment and to play? But since we're at Upstart today, I'm focusing on play. But we could ask the same thing about attachment. Because it can look like the state gets it. We have play policies. So it can look like we have the play agenda because we have logos and we have our fantastic purple Play Talk Read bus. It can look like we get play. But then there's all this research evidence. So this is David Whitbread's 2012 report called The Importance of Play. Here's the subtitle, A Report on the Value of Children's Play and a Series of Policy Recommendations and he says this on the first page. In too many countries across Europe, an earlier is better approach has been adopted. The emphasis is on introducing children at the earliest possible stages to the formal skills <coughs> of literacy and numeracy. And then he uses a phrase that I have never seen used in any <laughs> other report. This is inimical to the provision of rich play opportunities. Inimical. Inimical is close to evil, dangerous, damaging. So I found myself thinking, if the state gets it, there's a report that has the word inimical in it <laughs> about policies that the government currently has in place, even though they have play logos. I could get very frustrated by this. And of course, at one level, I am frustrated. But I cope with frustration by getting curious. How is it that we can have play logos? And I'm sure there are people in the government who've read David Whitbread's report, and they know about the research evidence. And now we've got all these people around the country that have been to see the resilience film. If the state gets it, why do we need an upstart campaign? Why isn't it already part of policy? Why are all of you not out in the sunshine instead of in this slightly dark room? Why do we need to have an AGM if the state gets it? Which, of course, a number of you clearly think they don't because of that ripple of no. Okay. If I ask myself that question, then here's my next question. Maybe our society doesn't get it either. So maybe we shouldn't think of Upstart as about educational change, as important as that is. Maybe we need to think of Upstart as a campaign about cultural change, which changes slightly what we think we're doing and how we're doing it and the language that we use. Although, if you see education as simply about culture, and I don't know if I like the word simply there, then that isn't such a big shift. And Sue Palmer is sitting down here in the front going like this. No, it's not a big shift for her. But I'll bet it's a sh big shift for some people. That education and culture and a campaign could be 
part and parcel of the same thing. The education is part of culture. That's really what David was trying to say. David got Glastonbury here. Like, that is really cultural. <laughs> okay? Okay. So if we get that far, <coughs> that brings me to my final stop. That brings me to thinking about fear. So now I ask myself, <clears throat> does play scare us in modern 21st century Scotland, even with our play policies? Here are three reasons that I think play scares us. And I think a campaign for play taps into that fear. If you are arguing for play as a basis for, as the ground within which children should grow up, then you have to live with uncertainty. That's what Alison Gopnik is saying in her book. When you plant a garden, you hope. You do your best hoping that if you that if you've got it right and you laid it out right and you paid attention to the light and you paid attention to the soil and you got your fertilizer and you hope that the flowers will blossom <coughs> and you live with uncertainty. And so I think a play agenda requires us to live with uncertainty. It's about process. It's not about guarantee out outcomes. There's no control. We have to live in a bit of faith. That is scary in a world in which I think more and more grown-ups feel scared today. Parents of babies are overwhelmed with the amount of parenting advice they get. In fact, some people think that we really shouldn't be talking so much about the neuroscience because that just makes parents even more anxious. I take the view that the neuroscience is incredibly helpful if it's delivered in a tone that isn't scary. But if you are now asking already scared parents to endorse a play agenda, to live with more uncertainty, I think it taps into fear. Here's a second reason that I think play creates fear for us. <clears throat> if we're going to promote a play agenda, we fear being perceived as inadequate. When you let your children run on the street today, you would be seen as a bad parent because you're putting them at risk of traffic. When you let your child have a temper tantrum because you in Astas, because you understand about the neuroscience, you, you know that Mrs. McGlinchey might be at the end of the aisle going, can you know keep that bear under control? If you're a teacher who wants to take the children out to draw trees, you fear being perceived as an inadequate teacher because you're not apparently focused on numeracy and literacy. If you're a head teacher who wants to promote that, you have to stand up to your local education authority. If you're a politician, maybe one named John Swinney, you fear being perceived as an inadequate politician because you don't appear to be interested in pushing numeracy and literacy when Scotland has such low rates of numeracy and literacy. It takes courage to promote a play agenda when that is the wider culture in which you find yourselves operating. And so when you decide that you're brave enough even to do both of these things, then you risk being regarded as a troublemaker. <laughs> Countercultural action <coughs> always threatens somebody. So I can think of the stories that I've heard of the teachers who have told me that they are not allowed to talk about the Upstart campaign because it's not council policy. <laughs> And some of you are laughing and some of you are nodding your head. I can think of the woman who wanted to schedule a local community discussion of Upstart. And she, she needed to book a room to do that. And when they asked what she wanted to talk about, and she said she wanted to talk about Upstart, they told her that she couldn't book a council-owned property because Upstart wasn't council policy. I think that's fear. If you want to do this, if you really want to be an upstarter, and you really want to talk about play, then you need to know that it will threaten other people. Because I, what I am trying to say, and I think what David is trying to say, is that if a push for play 
is countercultural now, and it taps into people's fear. And you will need to live with uncertainty. You will need to be risk being perceived as inadequate, and you will need to know that you will threaten somebody. And you will need to say, "Here we go with curiosity," because that's just part of the parcel. So as I wind up, here's a lesson all of that tells us. That giving our children what they truly need, first of all, requires that we be able to confront our own fears. And that's as true for parents as it is for systems. If you really want to be an upstarter, you're going to have to help your system be brave. And systems are a bit scared. It's hard for systems to be brave. So here's the bad news, upstarters. I think <coughs> that upstart taps into fear. Okay? I just think, I have come to the conclusion that upstart's scaring some people. And that's actually good, because it means the message is getting out there but it's not always fun. So I hope it is helpful to know and remember in the middle of that, that upstart and a vision for play and a different vision for society like David was talking about, is not just about the evidence, it's about courage. This is a campaign for courage and that requires courage to drive it. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. I think there are new energies in the country. There are new discourses and new topics. There's ACEs and trauma and biology and health that now exists in the country, that discord, that discussion that didn't exist in April. And the interest and the concern about that, that energy now exists to tap into a discussion about play. And if we bring to that something about our historical awareness and more historical curiosity about how we got to where we are now, how we got to neoliberalism, which is that, that we are all worth the money that we spend, or the money we're going to churn out once we've grown into an adult, that's neoliberalism. David didn't use that word, but that's what he's talking about. How did we get from social democratic welfare state in the 1940s to neoliberalism in 2017? That's what Thompson's book helps us to think about. And if I give you two more tiny sentences from it, that I took hope from his book, he says on page 105, in the 1940s, when attachment ideas were being in introduced, the state largely resisted action. Change came from below. Below are the citizens. Below are the people. Below is the grassroots. Below is you. Below is us. I think the change will come from grassroots energy. And part of the point of his book is that grassroots energy drove change in the 1940s. So if we ask, what next for Upstart? In the next year, where does Upstart go? I think the thing that I find most valuable in remembering is that we are on a journey of courage. Thank you.